Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. This is Matthew Good on Matthew Good. So, 99, where it's a beautiful midnight, certainly picks up where uh, Underdogs takes off. You know, Hello Time Bomb, Strange Days, Load Me Up. Yeah. Two Junos. Yeah, I guess we did have two Junos. But you didn't go. I was in Los Angeles, man. Yeah. It could be bothered. Uh, you know, for me, award shows, it's kind of like putting like Chagall and Mark Rothko and Kandinsky in a room and trying to decide who's a better painter. Mm. Why would you do that? To sell more records. Um, yeah, so that's just, I don't know. It's a, to me, it's counterproductive. And this whole, and, and the other thing I don't like about it too is how they sell it to be the whole Canadian experience, right? Mm. It's like that, that to me is just, that's too much. That's just too much. So I just don't, it's not that you want to know what people can go enjoy it. They can like it. And that, you know what, again, have fun with it. If you want to have fun with it, that's great. That doesn't mean I have to, you know what I mean? I can have, I can believe what I want to believe. Fine. I don't go. I didn't go the year I won. I didn't go the year I won one for best video. It's okay. My mom's got them. Where'd she keep them? Some, I think somewhere, I don't know, somewhere in the house. It's got them somewhere. And that's just another small taste. It's part two of an honest history of Matthew Good as told by Matthew Good. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. Welcome again. I'm Alan Cross. I've always wanted to do a show on Matt Good, but I wanted him to tell his own story. And when I finally got the chance, the result was one of the most honest conversations I've ever had with an artist. And this is part two of that long talk. We left off in 1999, just as the third full Matthew Good album was about to be released. Beautiful Midnight came out on September 14th, 1999, and it was loaded with hits. Load Me Up, Hello Time Bomb, and this one, Strange Days. The Matthew Good Band, Strange Days, one of the major hits from the Beautiful Midnight album. Highly successful record. It might have been even more successful had the Matthew Good Band been functioning properly. There was a lot of internal dysfunction. And Matt wasn't interested in playing the games he felt he had to with the American music industry. The album had received a U.S. release, but because Matt was uncooperative, things didn't go as well as they might have otherwise. It was an ethical and moral thing on his part. So, what happened next? Well, it wasn't good. Here's Matt. A couple of years go by, we're into the audio of being, mm. which was awkward. Oh, I threw up that entire year, every day. I think I basically ate apples, energy bars, and drank like spirulina and boost. But you were sick. For eight months. You, you had an actual, okay, first of all, there was a stuff going on with the band, got very political and weird, right? Yeah. But then you ended up with the... Oh, I have sarcoid. Sar yeah. so what, what is it? Sarcoidosis. It's um, basically a disease that can affect different parts of your body. For me, it affects my lungs. Uh, Bernie Mac had it. Oh, okay. Right? Bernie Mac had it. Though, you he, know, he's, he's dead. Yeah, he is dead. Uh, and of course, the official thing was he died from pneumonia, but he definitely died probably from complications of sarcoid um, from the pneumonia. Basically, if in your lungs... If it's progressive, usually in people it disappears after two to four years. If it's progressive, it basically slowly turns your um, lung tissue to scar, mm. into scar tissue. So basically just imagine like your lungs turning into concrete and you can't breathe anymore. So, yeah. So, I mean, and I have never been on, I mean, I, I have a, I have a inhaler for it. Mm. But I've never been on, like, they put you on prednisone, like steroids. That's nasty yeah, stuff. Yeah, which, you know, which causes a whole bunch of problems. And I've never done that, so. But, yeah, so there was that. And then that's really, at that period of time, too, for the anxiety really, really started to get very, very bad. The whole recording process was a nightmare. Um, and then. Well, what was, the, what was the source of the anxiety, other than the fact that you were had, had this hardcore? This, this, the band. Because this was the end of yeah, this MGV. Was, yeah, well, I mean, the anxiety started before that, right? The, you know, what had happened was is that I had gone to Whistler 
in the summer to write. And, you know, as was usually the case with the band, I'd spend 14 hours a day working. And, you know, everyone adds, like, the flourish here and the flourish there. And, and uh, you know, it's just suddenly, you know, everybody's doing kind of thing, right? And after a while, you know, the, the, the Three Musketeers uh, element wears off on you, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so I was up there for a while. Dave came up for a little bit, but unfortunately he was a little late because he was busy with Holly Gnarlin, working with Holly. Nothing against Holly, but you know what I mean? You know, I thought, you know, you're in this band, buddy. You know, we're coming off a, a you know, near triple platinum album. Like, what are you doing? And uh, so I finished the record up there. I finished writing it. And then, I, and back, and then I did, wasn't tracking anything on a computer. It was just all acoustic guitar. So we go into rehearsals. We rehearse these songs. And that's when it begins, right? People are trying to inject ideas because they know that if they do, then they can make a case for publishing, mm. right? And just the entire process was just hampered by that completely. Finally, we went in to make the record. I was just ill the entire, like most of the time we made the record. I was just, it's kind of like, you know, uh, um, I'll break your heart, you know, where Jeff just goes into the, the stall and just throws up. Mm. It's just like basically like that, same thing. And uh, I remember doing it before vocal takes, actually. And then when the record was done, we had to go back in again because the label called Management, Management called Dave, and, you know, we needed another single. So the mechanism was used to pressure me to write another single. So I decided to just with all of them and I wrote Antipop. I thought there is no way in hell anyone's gonna look at this song and go, this is good. No way in hell. Oh, but no, no, we record, oh, it's great. And it becomes a singer. I know, and I'm sitting there going like, we just recorded Truffle Pigs, and like, which is a 10 million time better song. I'm like, what are you guys, on crack? Yeah. So anyway, then things got weird. Um, we did the tour that summer, no one talked to one another. Mm. Whole tour, no one spoke to one another. I remember my 30th birthday was on that tour and I was in the hotel room in, in Calgary and this giant cake shows up in my hotel room with all these plates and cutlery and I sat there for two hours and then I just left the hotel and went to the, went to the Corral Center, right? Mm. I'm just like, you know. Didn't talk to any of my band that day, pretty much, you know? And uh, it was ridiculous. The whole tour was ridiculous. And I uh, got in a car accident in that tour uh, while being drove to a venue. Hurt my back pretty bad. Um, and then it, the disintegration really started to happen. You know, like the day the album came out, we went out to do an autograph signing at a record store. Dave refused to ride in the same car as the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, everyone was having conversations on the telephone for hours at a time. When you get to that level of success, everyone's just like, well, you know, without me, the band can't exist. Right. Without me, the band can't exist. Without me, the band can't exist. And unfortunately, I have suffered in the past from the personality type where I just try to placate other people's needs very much. And at the end, I just couldn't do it. I just put my foot down and went, you know what, guys? I'm so fucking tired right now. I am. I just don't know what to do. Uh, you know, you got no one wants to tour this record. Well, at least we could tour this record. No one wants to tour the record, and so I guess that's it. And we're done. And uh, that's pretty much how it happened. And I started writing Avalanche like a month later. The thing I always said then was, is that you know, and I took a, primarily most of the heat in the public's eye for mm -hmm. it happening. Uh, well, it was your name on the band, it's so. Of course, and, that's ex and you know what, I didn't open my mouth after the initial exchanges that happened for that reason. But like my best friend always says, I'm still waiting for their solo records to come out. And that was the end of the Matthew Good Band. Now we get into the second act, Matt Good, solo artist. And you know something? It's still tense and strange. 
Matt tells the story himself next. This is part two of Matthew Good in his own words. Okay, let's recap. The Matthew Good band was a group that gave Matt top billing, something that he never wanted. This all came as the result of a public misperception. The group does well enough through the 1990s, but by the time we get to 2001, it's one big pile of dysfunction and illness, and the entity known as the Matthew Good Band dissolves. However, Matt carries on, and he writes a record called Avalanche. So, <laughs> Avalanche, we started writing it, like, a, like you say, a month later, and uh, there's a marked change in style because, again, it's you, right? Finally got to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. And you see, I wasn't fighting things anymore. Right, like, as a songwriter, you know, you you go well. You get to you get to find these instruments the way you want them to fit and work in a song. A bass can be melodic. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, coming from someone who was really raised an influence on '60s and '70s music, the bass to me was always a very melodic instrument. But also someone that was massively influenced by like bands like the Pixies and the Replacements and Afghan Wigs and that kind of things. It was a straight eight instrument, you know what I mean? That moved in steps. So, so I had the ability for the first time to command how the drums would be, work, you know what I mean? Or how this everything would work in the context of how a song was put together. Mm -hmm. Not fighting parts with different people that didn't really kind of make sense in my head when it was finally done. But, so you would placate everybody who was actually involved in the session? Yeah. Right, okay. And in, in, in some cases, in some cases, I, I did my best to fight it. In some cases, people just came up with really great ideas. Like, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna say that Dave's lead, you know, Dave, the, 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 the guitar part that Dave came up for, for Giant, you know, the picking bit in the verses wasn't fantastic. I mean, it was a great part. But, you know, it, it, when you're a songwriter and you finally, after all those years, get the freedom to be able to look at a song beginning to end and go, this is what I want it to do, that album suddenly became balanced. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like there wasn't, everything wasn't competing against one another. It was what it was. Matt Good, that's Weapon, one of the singles from his first solo record, Avalanche, from March of 2003. The next record was ready by the middle of June of 2004, just 15 months later. It was called White Light Rock and Roll Review. That record for me was more of an experiment, right? I mean, it was an experiment to be, you know, because like I had been listening to like a lot of Buddy Holly a, a, and, and, you know, I was watching Hail Hell Rock and Roll over and over again and stuff and going to myself, you know, I want to work, do something, and I want this to be live off the floor, and I want it to be as, you know, primitive as it possibly can be. And so that's what I did. And just so that I could say that once in my life I made a record like that. Because you know what, you listen to those, those recordings, and you think about that, and you think about the fact that they played all at once in one room. Mm. And, uh, it astounds me. Like t things like that astound me. You know, it always reminds me of that famous picture of Thelonious Monk. You know how he would change music on the fly at his piano with like 17 session musicians looking over his shoulder so they make sure they get the changes because he just wouldn't tell anybody, right? So we got that. I got that out of the way, and then of course the inevitable greatest hits had to come up, right? As an artist, you'd really like that to be mostly your album, your you know, album cuts because that's what fans really want to hear. But you lose that battle to singles. Mm. I got to, I got to do rooms though, so. But it's, it's it's flash cash too. I mean, it comes out at a, probably around Christmas. Yeah. And you know, people buy it for their nephews and cousins and daughters and sons, and so it's it's a cash good. for the label. Alert Status Red from both the White Light Rock and Roll Review album and the Greatest Hits collection in a coma. You know, that's actually a very solid collection. Two CDs and a DVD loaded with stuff. The DVD is, is great because just like with a movie, you can turn on the audio commentary and we hear Matt describe the videos as we watch them. It's pretty cool. So everything's great now, right? Matt has a solid solo career. 
He's writing songs that he wants to write, recording them how he wants them to be recorded, so it's, it's perfect. Not quite. Some real honesty for Matt coming next. This is part two of Matt Good in his own words. Now, I've done thousands of interviews, and I gotta tell you something, what you're about to hear is some of the most honest stuff anyone has ever told me. So everything seems to be going reasonably well from a professional point of view. You're, you're on your own, you're, you're calling your own shots, but then everything goes dark. Yeah, well, I got divorced. And that was a sudden thing. Yeah, it was a very, very sudden thing, and there was a great deal of betrayal involved in it and things, you know, that I would find out mm. that I really didn't need to find out. Like, I mean, I didn't drink for 11 years of my life and I've never really done drugs. So, you know, when you find out after the fact that your ex-wife, you know, brought a suitcase of cocaine into your house to hide because some guy she knew was under investigation for dealing it and you don't know that at the time. Bit of a deal breaker. Yeah, a bit of a problem. And among other things, I didn't leave her though. Uh, <laughs> I basically went to my general practitioner and I was on antidepressants at the time to try to deal with the anxiety that I was already feeling. He upped the dosage of uh, a drug called Effexor that I was on. And one of the things that it does is at higher dosages, it amplifies mania in people who suffer from bipolarity. Mm -hmm. Now bipolarity is a genealogical disorder, which means you have it from birth. And, and if, you, if I looked at my pathology honestly, um, my whole life, you know, on Ritalin at seven, um, didn't sleep for three or four days at a time, in my 20s, it all made sense. Right? Well, everyone was partying in their 20s when we were on the road. I was stone sober. Mm. I was just manic, right? But when you get into your 30s, um, I started suffering from dysphoric mania, which is not like a happy, jubilant mania. It's more kind of akin to being put in a coffin with the two things you fear most, buried underground, and then having that coffin shrink and the time is, you know, times that by about a thousand. Right. It's hell. Uh, and you're awake for it. So. I was upped, the prescription was upped, but of course my general practitioner didn't know, you know, obviously that I was bipolar. So he gave me Ativan to counteract the mania that I was experiencing and that led to one a day to all the way to six months later to 12 a day. And literally I could be sitting here talking to you having this conversation right now, having taken 12 throughout the course of a day. And if I gave a normal person had one, they'd be asleep for 12 mm -hmm. hours. So I went to England uh, briefly. I, I was gonna go to La Rochelle in France and write a book actually for six months. And I got to my friend's house in Bristol and I just had a complete manic episode. What is a manic episode? Well, it depends on what kind of mania you suffer from. And it also depends on what kind of uh, bipolarity, bipolarity you have. Uh, type 1 bipolarity is a slow cycling illness in which you can go through extended periods of mania and extended periods of depression, right? So you can be up for like four months and down for four months kind of thing. And usually mania is associated with like you have a, a lot of energy, you're super excited, you, you mm. do things that are kind of a little bit weird and out of character, right? Dysphoric mania is when you have that exact same kind of manic energy, but you have the depressive state at the same time. Ooh. And it is, it is, uh, I wouldn't, if, if it could be turned into a weapon, it would be worse than a nuclear weapon. It's like the most horrible thing in the world. And that's why people who suffer from it tend, you know, the suicide rate is so significant. Um, not because people want to die, it's because they just want it to stop. Mm. But what happened was, is I ended up coming back home, all my stuff was in storage, so I ended up going out to my parents' townhouse. And uh, one night my dad made it some barbecued some steaks and we had, we had some beers and like I'm not a big drinker. So I had like two or three beers and I went upstairs to watch a movie on my laptop in my, my mom's office which d doubles as a uh, spare bedroom. And I took a couple more out of to go to sleep and they didn't work and kind of kicked in with the alcohol and I guess I cooked a couple more, a couple more and then I had a shower. And I asked my mom to bring me a beer while I was in the shower and she did and I went I don't know what the hell happened. All I know is that I guess I hit the floor in the bedroom. My mom and dad were in the TV room next to the bedroom and my mom heard me hit the floor. I woke up in the hospital and I had to willfully commit myself. So you were there for how long? I was in the hospital for about a week, mm. um, thereabouts, I think. Um, and then you have to go through outpatient 
um, you know. The thing about it was is I was massively cooperative with the process, massively. You know, I was very, very lucky. Uh, the, the people at the hospital were extremely, extremely great. They never, they, you know, they, they were very low-key about checking me in, like unregistered kind of thing. My psychiatrist actually turned out to be someone who, from my old neighborhood who, went, who graduated from my high school a year after me. So talking to him was great, you know, because of the relation. And uh, for me, it was like a mass enlightenment. Oh, this has been the problem. Well, it was finding a solution to what had been bothering you for yeah, so long. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and then you go through the process of, of, of outpatient care and finding a drug regime that works for you. And uh, Wasn't this something that Nick Drake had? Yeah. Well, you see, this is the thing, and this is the, w with regards to how Nick died, um, there are a lot of different stories, right? I mean, some people believe that he got up that morning because he had a bowl of cornflakes, right? And he, and he got up that morning and he had a bowl of cereal and that he took too many pills and died. Mm. But his family contends, or some in his family contend, that he had taken a pill and before and fallen asleep for a brief period or not at all, and that he couldn't get back to sleep. So he woke up, he had a bowl of cereal, took another pill, because he was out of it from the first one, and the combination of the two accidentally killed him. Right. In his case, I don't know. All I know, it's a damn shame mm. because of how talented a man he was. But, um, you know, in my case, basically, it led to a massive epiphany and obviously the creation of that record as, a, you know, as, as uh, it being a very cathartic experience. And then, you know, going from that to standing on stages by myself translating it to people instead of with a band to start with, which was the right move to do, you know, the right move to make. Matt Good with Born Losers from his 2007 album Hospital Music. That recording was from a 2008 live record entitled Live at Massey Hall. Now this brings us to 2009 in the album Vancouver. And with a title like that, you would think that this would be a tribute to Matt's hometown. Not quite. If you look at the, if the, the city's music history, I mean, we're predominantly known for hardcore in the 80s and late 70s, 80s, that kind of thing. And of course, no one was gonna ever entitle an album Vancouver from those days. I can't see No Means No or <laughs> DOA or you know, Adversity or anyone uh, uh, doing that. But um, you know, for me, the reason that I, I, I did it was is that you know, I lived downtown for the better part of 16 years and I saw one of what I think, I mean, given all the cities I've visited in my life and stayed in for extended periods of time, one of the most dramatic changes that I've ever seen a city undergo, especially with regards to the diminishment of its arts community. The diminishment? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, well, expand, I'd, here in Toronto, we didn't know, what? Yeah, well, see, so in Toronto, you still have one. <laughs> um, well, live venues. I mean, well, for, that's true, yeah. for first and foremost, right? Um, just grassroots, the arts uh, at all levels on a grassroots level, right? I mean, when I was coming up, you know, I mean, a band could, for example, play the town pump on a Tuesday night with absolutely nobody in it, right? You could come back the next Wednesday, get a middle slot, maybe there'd be 15 people, right? That phenomenon was translated all across the country. You know, you get in a van in 1994, and you start on the island, you go all the way to Halifax, and you have the exact same thing happen in every city, and then on the way back, you do the same thing, and maybe there'd be 10 more people in the room, right? But you know, in Vancouver, we had those we had those staple rooms, like the Town Pump, like the Crew Elephant, like the Smiling Buddha, and places like that. And even though the Commodore has been redone, you know, now it pretty much only caters to you know touring acts or acts that are going to fill it. So we've lost that. You know, even Richards on Richards is now going. It's it's had kind of a, a devastating effect on, I think the let's say the musical ambition of acts that are coming out of Vancouver or the greater Vancouver area, you know? I think that over the last, you know, six or seven years, one sound sort of has dominated all the bands that have come out of that area. Over the last, I would say, 15 years, the edge 
of Vancouver has been lost. And that edge, as you well know, produced a lot of music that was definitely influential. Mm -hmm. Just the edge that I grew up with and I was exposed to in the 80s is just, it non it's non-existent. I mean, I can't count how many times a day Kennedy's came to town mm -hmm. when I was a kid. You know? Oh, everybody would come up the coast, yeah. Yeah, everyone, right? Because, and how many bands from Vancouver influenced specifically what happened in Seattle, you know, in the early 90s? It was like, I mean, I mean <laughs> there was a lot of bitter people in Vancouver when that whole thing blew up going, hold on a second here. There's Great Whales of the Sea from Matt Good's 2009 album, Vancouver. We'll leave the final word on Matt Good to Matt Good. Let me just ask you one more thing. Sure. Do you ever look back at the stuff that you've done and go, wow, that was really awesome and amazing. I can't believe I did that. I'm so proud. Or conversely, what the hell was I thinking? I think I probably look back more and, and think, what the hell was I thinking? I'm, I'm one of those people that uh, I carry a lot of guilt for a lot of things around, you know? Even to this day, even given all the problems, you know? Like, was it me? Was it was the fact that I had an illness that, was that the reason the band broke up? Or was, you know, or, or was I difficult? Or did I, was I characterized as difficult in the media or, or with people that work for me because of that reason? You know, th those are things that I that, that do cross my mind and that I do admit could, you know, definitely be a, a possibility and played a role in those things. And to deny that would be ignorant, right? I mean, I, would, I wouldn't do it, so. Thanks to Matt for his time and thanks to Mike Sullivan for helping with the interview. Technical production for The Ongoing History of New Music is by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts.